Hello, my name is Luisa Cochella. I am a group leader at the IMP, part of the Vienna Biocenter. In my lab, we're fascinated by the process through which a single cell gives rise to a multicellular organism with a huge diversity of different cell types that are reproducibly arranged into tissues and organs to form the different functional parts of the organism. And the particular aspect of this process that we're interested in is in how different cell types are diversified and specialized during the process of development. Let me highlight just how specialized some of these cells can be. What we're looking at here is first a schematic of a human motor neuron in which the soma and the axon of that neuron are drawn to scale to show the relative size. Now, this very dramatic morphological specialization of this neuron enables it to conduct information through long range distances in our bodies. In the middle here, we have a zoom in view of a muscle cell where you see the almost crystalline arrangement of sarcomeres in the cell, as well as how the cell pushes its organelles towards one end. And this allows the cell to generate force efficiently. And finally, in this last shot here, what we're looking at is a section of a pancreas in which you can see an islet containing the insulin producing beta cells. And these cells, as I said, morphologically, not very dramatic, but molecularly, they have unique specializations that allow these cells to respond to certain metabolic conditions in a way that's different from what every other cell in our bodies would do, and that enables these cells to control glucose homeostasis in the body. This separation of function across different cell types actually has enabled the evolution of complexity in animal body plants. And my lab is interested in trying to understand the basic gene regulatory mechanisms that control these cellular diversification and specialization. However, I also want you to think about how these very dramatic specializations leave some cells vulnerable to particular environmental or genetic perturbations. And you can, for example, imagine how this particular cell might be susceptible to any disruption of transport of molecules across the body from one end to the other. So to experimentally address questions about cell diversification, we use a model organism which is a nematode worm called Cynoraptitis elegans. And we use this animal for a number of reasons, and I will highlight two of them. First of all, in the adult stage, this animal has only 959 somatic cells. However, within that very small number of cells, it contains a very large cell type diversity with many different neuron types, different muscle cells, different epidermal cells, and so on and so forth. So we think that this worm actually strikes a perfect balance between complexity and simplicity that allows us to understand how different cell types are made during development. Now, the other great advantage of using this worm as a model for development is actually displayed in this beautiful tree. Because development of this worm is invariant from one animal to the next, it was possible in a heroic effort by John Sulston to map the precise pattern of cell divisions that gives rise to every single cell in the body of this animal. And what that means is if I want to study this particular neuron in the head of the worm, I know that in every single animal, this neuron arises through this very stereotypic pattern of cell divisions. So this gives us a huge power to try to understand how the different cell types uh, of the body of this animal form during development. And in fact, if you want to learn more about this fantastic model organism, I highly recommend you to look at these two resources, Wormbook and Worm Atlas, for more information. Now, using the worm, we have been uh, trying to understand or working in two different areas uh, of how different cell types form. The first one is how does cell type diversity develop through this pattern of cell divisions? And here we have been asking questions related to how transient transcriptional inputs during the developmental history of a cell impact the final identity that that cell adopts in such a way that two cells that terminally express the same transcription factor and should adopt the same cell fate actually are diversified by the presence or absence of those transient inputs. And I encourage you to read more about that uh, in this publication. However, what I want to tell you more about today is another area that we have been focusing on, and that is in trying to understand what the role of repressors is in specifying or shaping different cellular identities. And we tend to think about a cellular identity as being defined by the set of genes that that cell expresses, and that is under control of 
numbers or combinations of transcription factors. However, what I would like to discuss with you today is what is the contribution of repressors to selectively turning off or tuning down specific genes within a cell type and that how can impact on that cell's identity and function. And there's a number of reasons that we are interested in repressors. Actually, Jacques Monod called genetic repression one of the big secrets of life. And that is because without repression, it is impossible to generate spatial or temporal specificity in gene expression. But also repressors are essential to generate the precise kinetics of gene expression change that are required during development. And in particular, we're fascinated by the contribution of a class of post-transcriptional repressors called microRNAs. MicroRNAs are short RNAs between 21 and 20 nucleotides long that in the context of an argonaut protein guide that argonaut protein to the 3' UTRs of mRNAs where they will execute translational repression as well as mRNA destabilization. Now, this is a very, very broad class of transcriptional repressors. Animals have hundreds of them and they have in fact expanded together with animal complexity. And microRNAs are very important for animal development. The first microRNAs, which were named LIN4 and LED7, were actually described and discovered in the nematode C. elegans because of their important roles in controlling the timing of larval development. Not only in worms, microRNAs are important, uh, and not only for larval development, but microRNAs have been found to be essential actually for the development of every animal where they have been studied. And these experiments were enabled by the fact that microRNAs, which are these short RNAs, have to be produced from longer RNA precursors through two sequential cleavages by two RNAs enzymes, namely Drosha and Dicer. And the cool thing about this common pathway for microRNA biogenesis is that we can remove Drosha or Dicer, and that will abolish the production of microRNAs as a whole. And when this, is, when this happens in a variety of different animal models, that causes problems with embryogenesis, as you can see here. C. elegans larvae, which would normally develop into these beautifully structured animals, in the absence of Drosha and its cofactor Pasha, completely failed to develop. Zebrafish also fails to develop normally in the absence of Dicer, and so do mice. Because microRNAs are clearly very important, there's been a huge effort in trying to understand what individual microRNAs do. However, this has been challenging. And so we thought that we would use the worm to try to understand what the contribution of different microRNAs is. And we thought we would take advantage of um, properties of the worm that enable us to see when and where microRNAs are expressed and therefore we could make hypotheses about when and where they could act in development. And I'm showing you two examples here of GFP-based reporters for two different microRNAs in C. elegans embryos. The first one, MIR35, as you can see, is very broadly expressed in this early embryo, while a second microRNA, LAUSI6, is expressed in just one single cell, this is going to develop into a neuron out of the whole animal. So clearly there's two very different types of expression patterns. Some microRNAs are very, very broadly and abundantly expressed. Some microRNAs are very cell type specific. And we wanted to know just how many microRNAs would have one or the other type of expression pattern because this would tell us something very important about what, this or about what the function of these microRNAs could be. Obviously this microRNA may play a role in early development, while this microRNA would not play a role in early development, but would rather be expected to have a very cell type specific function. And so to try to understand more globally and more systematically when and where different microRNAs are expressed in this animal, we took a step back and we decided to do small RNA sequencing. So this is a method by which we can extract all the small RNAs in either embryos or different larval stages of C. elegans and we can quantify the relative abundance of every microRNA within these embryos or larvae. And what I've done here is I've ranked microRNAs by their relative abundance, and what I hope you can see is that there's a few microRNAs that are very, very abundant, in particular in embryos, this cluster here, while most microRNAs seem relatively lowly expressed. However, because we're sampling microRNAs from the whole animal, a microRNA that is lowly expressed could either be expressed at low levels throughout the whole animal or could be very highly expressed in a single cell, much like LAUSI6 here. 
So what this uh, expression profile told us is that potentially there are many other microRNAs that could be expressed with very high cell type specificity. So in order to address that, we generated similar kinds of reporters for a large number of microRNAs, and we looked at their expression throughout the animal. And this is another advantage of C. elegans as a model system, which is that we can generate hundreds of transgenic animals relatively easily, and we can look at the expression pattern of those reporters within the whole intact animal, much like you can see here. So when we did that, we found that, in fact, within this uh, class of microRNAs that seemed relatively lowly abundant, there are actually a lot of microRNAs that are expressed with very high cell type specificity. And I'm showing you some examples here. This one is just in a pair of neurons, a few glial cells, a few muscle cells, and, and so on and so forth. So what this told us is that it seems that there are two broad classes, at least based on expression patterns of, of microRNAs in this animal, with a relatively small number of microRNAs that are extremely highly abundant. And in fact, this cluster that I highlighted here corresponds to microRNAs of the MIR35 and MIR51 families, which together make up for half of the microRNA content in the embryo. And they are both very broadly expressed in the animal, while most microRNAs are actually expressed with very high cell type specificity. Now, what this knowledge allowed us to do is to make hypotheses about what these microRNAs might do. And I want to tell you a few words about this particular microRNA, which we found out was expressed in just three pairs of neurons. This was actually the work of Tanya Drexel, a fantastic PhD student in the lab. And what Tanya found is that MIR-791, this particular microRNA, is expressed in just three pairs of neurons, which she could identify, because in C. elegans, we know the identity of every single somatic cell, including all of its neurons. And the interesting thing that Tanya found is that these neurons had been previously implicated in carbon dioxide sensing. So this is a vital cue for the animal to sense, and under high concentrations of carbon dioxide, C. elegans tries to escape. Um, and so what Tanya could do was measure this escape response in animals that were wild type or lacked MIR-791. And what I'm showing you here are the results of some of those experiments where you can see in black wild type animals, the wild type response to an increase in carbon dioxide. And in red is the response of animals that lack MIR-791, while in green is the response of animals that were defective from MIR-791, but where we added back a wild-type copy. So clearly, MIR-791 is necessary for the carbon dioxide response of these animals, something that we could not have figured out without knowing precisely where this microRNA is, uh, where this microRNA is expressed. So what Tanya found is that MIR-791, which is specifically expressed in these three pairs of neurons, actually represses within those cells two genes that are otherwise expressed throughout the whole body of the animal. These are ubiquitously transcribed genes, genes that we would normally consider housekeeping genes. Now, the interesting aspect of these is that we tend to think about uh, cellular identities as being defined by the specific genes that a cell expresses. But what these results told us is that the cell-specific repression of certain genes is also important to provide cells with specific properties and, and eventually with their correct and optimal functional properties. The other thing that we found extremely interesting about this study was that the regulation of broadly transcribed, of ubiquitously transcribed genes is thought to be achieved through relatively compact enhancers and promoters that enable transcription throughout all different cell types. And we therefore thought that the fact that post-transcriptional regulation, in this case by a microRNA, was being used to generate specificity in uh, broadly transcribed genes, could be pointing us towards a broader mechanism for how uh, the regulation of these ubiquitous genes can be achieved. So the way in which MIR-791 works is just one way in which microRNAs can be used to achieve cell type diversification or neuronal specialization in this case. The other case I wanted to briefly tell you about is the case of LAUSI6, which is expressed in a single neuron out of the whole animal. This neuron where LAUSI6 is expressed is the left member of a bilaterally symmetric pair of neurons in the head of the animal. These are sensory neurons. And the fact that LAUSI6 is expressed only on the left side allows this cell to adopt a different identity than its counterpart on the right side. 
the result of that is that these two sensory neurons now are able to respond to different cues from the environment. And this is actually essential for the animal's ability to chemotax and find uh, food sources or escape from um, unwanted situations. So these two different micronase act in very different ways, but I hope they highlight the power of these tiny post-transcriptional repressors to shape diversity in the nervous system of the animal. So because we found so many other micronase that were highly specific, we wanted to um, be able to go a little bit deeper and try to understand or, or uncover what are the different micronase that are expressed in different cell types. Now, of course, we could continue to use our reporter system. So we have already made reporters for many of these micronase, but we actually wanted to develop a system that would allow us to look at this problem from a different angle and ask, for example, if I'm interested in this particular neuron, how do I find, find out what are all the micronase that this neuron expresses? And so to address that, another fantastic PhD student from our program, Chiara Alberti, set out to develop a new method that would allow us to sequence the micronase from specific cell types, but without the need of isolating those cell types from within the whole animal. She took advantage of an enzyme that uh, exists in plants, but not in animals. And that enzyme is called HEN1, and it comes from Arabidopsis thaliana. And that enzyme methylates microRNAs at their three prime ends. So this modification does not normally happen in animal microRNAs. And so what that means is that we can exogenously express this enzyme within different tissues or cell types of our animal, and it will methylate micronase specifically within those compartments. So now the cell type specific micronase are methylated, but the micronase in the rest of the body of the animal are not. And so what that allows us to do is to do a total RNA extraction, which now contains both methylated and unmethylated RNAs. And through a very simple chemical treatment, we can distinguish between those two populations. So the treatment of RNA with sodium periodate will actually oxidize the terminal ribose of unmethylated RNA. However, that methylation that is deposited by HEN1 protects RNA from that cleavage and leaves the 3 OH intact to perform a ligation reaction. Now, we can ligate an adapter on the 3 end, we can ligate an adapter to the 5 end of the RNA, and that allows us to selectively amplify and sequence the microRNAs that had been methylated and therefore come from our tissue of interest. We called this method MIMSEQ for microRNOMES by methylation-dependent sequencing. And in this publication, Chiara could show that this method is very robust. For example, she performed an experiment to find out what are all the microRNAs in the nervous system of C. elegans, but she didn't perform that experiment once. She did it three different times by expressing the enzyme HEN1 in the nervous system under three completely different neuronal promoters. And what she found is that she got really the same results using these three different drivers. She also found out that the method is very specific. She could express the enzyme HEN1 in many different cell types, including, for example, the muscles of the pharynx, the intestine, the body wall muscles, and she could retrieve the microRNA content of these different cell types or tissues. She also found that the method was very, very sensitive. She could express the enzyme HEN1 in just a single pair of neurons out of the whole animal and retrieve with very high confidence the microRNAs that are expressed only in that neuron. And finally, in a great collaboration with the Ameris lab, we showed that the method was transferable and it, as it works also in Drosophila. And currently, another PhD student in the lab, Ariane Mandelbauer, is trying to move this method into mammalian systems as well. So with that, I wanted to give you a flavor for some of the questions that we study in my lab and what we have learned so far from looking at the contribution of micronase to development. So using the worm and the, the ability to do genetics and to look at reporters in this animal, we have been able to find out that many micronase are expressed with extremely high specificity within this animal. I showed you a couple of cases of specificity within the nervous system, but this is also true in other cell types. And I also wanted to give you a flavor and show you some of the methods that we use to study microRNAs in this context, including a method that we recently developed. However, microRNAs are just one type of 
gene expression regulators. And there's actually many, many other questions that are left to be answered related to how the zygote transforms into this fully mature animal. We have many questions that we are trying to address in the lab about the mechanisms that underlie this transformation, but I'm sure that you can imagine and think of many more. So with that, I would like to finish and highlight once more that the work I showed you was done by really two outstanding PhD students in the lab, Tanya Drexel and Kier Alberti, who recently graduated. The Vienna Biocenter is a great place for collaborations, and these two projects were done in collaboration with our colleagues here, with Stefan Ameris for the development of MIMSEQ and with Manuel Zimmer for the quantitative analysis of behavior of the animal in response to carbon dioxide. I'm also extremely grateful to my current group who are pursuing new and interesting questions, both in microRNA biology, highlighted in red, but also related to the first question I mentioned about how developmental histories impact on the terminal acquisition of cell fates, and I highlighted them in blue. I'm also extremely grateful to the support we get from scientific services at IMP and IMBA, our funders, and thank you for tuning in. Thank you.